Mr. McCoy here again with the Phantom Toll Booth, in this case with Part 9. As you recall, Alex said, that will happen only when you bring back rhyme and reason. And he was smiling, for he had seen right through Milo's plans. Now let's hurry, or we'll miss the evening concert. They followed him quickly up a flight of steps which couldn't be seen, and through a door which didn't exist. In a moment, they had left reality, which is sometimes a hard thing to tell, and stood in a completely different part of the forest. The sun was dropping slowly from sight, and stripes of purple and orange and crimson and gold piled themselves on top of the distant hills. The last shafts of light waited patiently for a flight of wrens to find their way home, and a group of anxious stars had already taken their places. Here we are! cried Alec, and with a sweep of his arm, he pointed toward an enormous symphony orchestra. Isn't it a grand sight? There were at least a thousand musicians ranged in a great arc before them. To the left and right were the violins and cellos, whose bows moved in great waves, and behind them, in numberless profusion, the piccolos, flutes, clarinets, oboes, bassoons, horns, trumpets, trombones, and tubas all playing at once. At the very rear, so far that they could hardly be seen, were the percussion instruments. And lastly, in a long line up one side of a steep slope, were the solemn bass fiddles. On a high podium in front stood the conductor, a tall gaunt man with dark, deep-set eyes and a thin mouth placed carelessly between his long pointed nose and his long pointed chin. He used no baton, but conducted with large sweeping movements which seemed to start at his toes and work slowly up through his body and along his slender arms and end finally at the tips of his graceful fingers. I don't hear any music, said Milo. That's right, said Alec. You don't listen to this orchestra. You watch it. Now pay attention. As the conductor waved his arms, he molded the air like handfuls of soft clay, and the musicians carefully followed his every direction. What are they playing? asked Tot, looking up inquisitively at Alec. The sunset, of course. They play it every evening about this time. They do? said Milo quizzically. Naturally, answered Alec, and they also play morning, noon, and night, when, of course, it's morning, noon, or night. Why, there wouldn't be any color in the world unless they played it. Each instrument plays a different color, he explained, and depending, of course, on what season it is and how the weather's to be, the conductor chooses his score and directs the day. But watch, the sun has almost set, and in a moment you can ask Chroma himself. The last colors slowly faded from the western sky, and as they did, one by one the instruments stopped until only the bass fiddles in their somber, slow movement were left to play the night, and a single set of silver bells brightened the constellations. The conductor let his arms fall limply at his sides, and soon stood quite still as darkness claimed the forest. That was a very beautiful sunset, said Milo, walking to the podium. It should be, was the reply. We've been practicing since the world began. And reaching down, the speaker picked Milo off the ground and set him on the music stand. I am Chroma the Great, he continued, gesturing broadly with his hands, conductor of color, maestro of pigment, and director of the entire spectrum. Do you play all day long? asked Milo when he had introduced himself. Ah, yes, all day, every day, he sang out, then pirouetted gracefully around the platform. I rest only at night, and even then, they play on. What would happen if you stopped? asked Milo, who didn't quite believe the color happened that way. So how do you suppose Chroma is going to answer Milo? What do you suppose happens if they stop playing? Share that with your fellow listener. See for yourself, roared Chroma, and he raised both hands high over his head. Immediately, 
the instruments that were playing stopped, and all at once, all color vanished. The world looked like an ominous coloring book that had never been used. Everything appeared in simple black outlines, and it looked as if someone with a set of paints the size of a house and a brush as wide could happily stay occupied for years. Then Chroma lowered his arms, the instru instruments began again, and the color returned. You see what a dull place the world would be without color, he said, bowing until his chin almost touched the ground. But what pleasure to lead my violins in a serenade of spring green, or hear my trumpets blare out the blue sea, and then watch the oboes tinted all in warm yellow sunshine. And rainbows are best of all, the blazing neon signs and taxi cabs with stripes and the soft muted tones of a foggy day. We play them all. As Chroma spoke, Milo sat with his arms open wide and Alec, Tock, and Humbug looked on in wonder. Now I really must get some sleep, Chroma yawned. We've had lightning, fireworks, and parades for the last few nights and I've had to be up to conduct them, but tonight is sure to be quiet. Then, putting his large hand on Milo's shoulder, he said, Be a good fellow, and watch my orchestra till morning, will you? And be sure to wake me at 523 for the sunrise. Good night, good night, good night. With that, he leaped lightly from the podium, and in three long steps, vanished into the forest. That's a good idea, said Tok, making himself comfortable in the grass as the bug grumbled himself quickly to sleep, and Alec stretched out in mid-air. And Milo, full of thoughts and questions, curled up on the pages of tomorrow's music and eagerly awaited the dawn. One by one, the hours passed, and at exactly 5.22, by Tok's very accurate clock, Milo carefully opened one eye and in a moment the other, everything was still, purple, dark blue, and black. Yet scarcely a minute remained to the long, quiet night. He stretched lazily, rubbed his eyelids, scratched his head, and shivered once as a greeting to the early morning mist. I must wake Chroma for the sunrise, he said softly. Then he suddenly wondered what it would be like to lead the orchestra and to color the whole world himself. The idea whirled through his thoughts until he quickly decided that since it couldn't be very difficult, and since they probably all knew what to do by themselves anyway, and since it did seem a shame to wake anyone so early, and since it might be his only chance to try, and since the musicians were already poised and ready, he would, but just for a little while. Do you agree with Milo's decision to conduct this orchestra? Share with your fellow listener. And if you could be in charge of this orchestra, what color would you make everything? For example, what color would you make the sunrise? Or high noon? Or sunset? Share that with your fellow listener. And so... As everyone slept peacefully on, Milo stood on tiptoes, raised his arms slowly in front of him, and made the slightest movement possible with the index finger of his right hand. It was now 5.23 a.m. As if understanding his signal perfectly, a single piccolo played a single note, and off in the east a solitary shaft of cool lemon light flicked across the sky. Milo smiled happily and then cautiously crooked his finger again. This time two more piccolos and a flute joined in, and three more rays of light danced lightly into view. Then with both hands he made a great circular sweep in the air and watched with delight as all the musicians began to play at once. The cellos made the hills glow red and the leaves and grass were tipped with a soft pale green as the violins began their song. Only the bass fiddles rested as the entire orchestra washed the forest in color. Milo was overjoyed because they were all playing for him and just the way they should. Won't Chroma be surprised, he thought, signaling the musicians to stop. I'll wake him now. 
but instead of stopping they continued to play even louder than before until each color became more brilliant than he thought possible. Milo shielded his eyes with one hand and waved the other desperately, but the colors continued to grow brighter and brighter and brighter until an even more curious thing began to happen. As Milo frantically conducted, the sky changed slowly from blue to tan and then to a rich magenta red. Flurries of light green snow began to fall and the leaves on the trees and bushes turned a vivid orange. All the flowers suddenly appeared black, the gray rocks became a lovely soft chartreuse, and even peacefully sleeping Tok changed from brown to a magnificent ultramarine. Nothing was the color it should have been, and yet the more he tried to straighten things out, the worse they became. I wish I hadn't started, he thought unhappily, as a pale blue blackbird flew by. There doesn't seem to be any way to stop them. He tried very hard to do everything just the way Chroma had done, but nothing worked. The musicians played on faster and faster, and the purple sun raced quickly across the sky. In less than a minute, it had set once more in the west, and then without any pause, risen again in the east. The sky was now quite yellow, and the grass a charming shade of lavender. Seven times the sun rose and almost as quickly disappeared as the colors kept changing. In a few minutes, a whole week had gone by. At last, the exhausted Milo, afraid to call for help on the verge of tears, dropped his hands to his sides. The orchestra stopped. The colors disappeared, and once again it was night. The time was 5.27 a.m. Wake up, everybody! Time for the sunrise! He shouted with relief and quickly jumped from the music stand. What a marvelous rest, said Chroma, striding to the podium. I feel as though I'd slept for a week. My, my, I see we're a little late this morning. I'll have to cut my lunch hour short by four minutes. He tapped for attention, and this time the dawn proceeded perfectly. You did a fine job, he said, patting Milo on the head. Someday I'll let you conduct the orchestra yourself. Tuck wagged his tail proudly, but Milo didn't say a word, and to this day no one knows of the lost week, but the few people who happened to be awake at 523 on that very strange morning. We better be getting along, said Tuck, whose alarm had begun to ring again, for there's still a long way to go. Chroma nodded a fond goodbye as they all started back through the forest. And in honor of the visit, he made all the wildflowers bloom in a breathtaking display. I'm sorry you can't stay longer, said Alex sadly. There's so much more to see in the forest of sight, but I suppose there's a lot to see everywhere if only you keep your eyes open. They walked for a while, all silent in their thoughts, until they reached the car and Alec drew a fine telescope from his shirt and handed it to Milo. Carry this with you on your journey, he said softly, for there is much worth noticing that often escapes the eye. Through it, you can see everything from the tender moss and a sidewalk crack to the glow of the farthest star, and most important of all, you can see things as they really are, not just as they seem to be. It's my gift to you. Milo placed the telescope carefully in the glove compartment and reached up to shake Alec by the hand. Then he stepped on the starter and with his head full of strange new thoughts, drove out of the far end of the forest. The easy rolling countryside now stretched before them in a series of dips and rises that leaped from one side of each crest and slid gently down the other in a way that made stomachs laugh and faces frown. As they topped the brow of the highest hill, a deep valley appeared ahead. The road, finally making up its mind, plummeted down as if anxious to renew acquaintance with the sparkling blue stream that flowed below. When they reached the floor of the valley, the wind grew stronger as it funneled through the rocks, and directly ahead, a bright-colored speck grew larger and larger. It looks like a wagon, cried Milo excitedly. It is a wagon, 
a carnival wagon second in top, and that's exactly what it was. Parked at the side of the road, painted bright red and looking quite deserted, on its side in enormous white letters bordered in black was the inscription, here it is, Cacophonous A Discord, and below in slightly smaller black letters bordered in white was Doctor of Dissonance. Perhaps if someone's at home, he might tell us how far we have to go, said Milo, parked next to the wagon. So who do you suppose is in this wagon? Share your prediction with your fellow listener. And now moments more of the Phantom Toll Booth. He tiptoed timidly up the three wooden steps to the door, tapped lightly, and leaped back in fright. For the moment he knocked, there was a terrible crash from inside the wagon that sounded as if a whole set of dishes had been dropped from the ceiling onto a hard stone floor. At the same time, the door flew open, and from the dark interior, a hoarse voice inquired, Have you ever heard a whole set of dishes drop from the ceiling onto a hard stone floor? We'll find out who this interesting character is as the Phantom Tollbooth continues.